After a ton of activity, our sun finally gives us a break, but more storming is still in store. That story and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.com. Dot edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather calms down a ton this week. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, the main region for this is because we've said goodbye to regions 3380, 86, and 87. Region 3386, in fact, launched several X-class flares as it rotated to the sun's west limb. And these big flares impacted radio communications in a big way, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Meanwhile, we've had even more M-class flares from region 3387, but thankfully it is now rotated to the sun's west limb. And what we're left with is whew, much quieter. We're basically dealing with region 3394, 95, these two regions, especially region 3395, as it rotates to the sun's west limb, it might pick up in big flare activity. So that could be a couple days from now. So get ready. On top of that, we also have a new region. This region may be labeled region 3402. On the 11th, it launched a big solar storm to the east of Earth. Not going to be Earth directed, but we're going to pay attention to that region as well. On top of that, we also have a big coronal hole in the north. This one's going to be rotating into the Earth strike zone here over the next maybe three days, and it could give us some fast solar wind. Now, it's not in the prime position to give us a lot of fast solar wind, but aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could get a bit of a show, not nearly like what we had just a few days ago, but it still could be a great thing for you. Meanwhile, we don't really have a lot else going on on the Earth-facing disk. We're going to have to wait for all of the activity that's going to be on the sun's far side. Switching to our M flare and dayside radio blackout threat meter, as we take a look at the X ray flux over this past week, look at all the big flares you see in here. These were ranging from an R1 to an R3 level radio blackout, and they were mainly from region 3386 and then also 3387. In fact, the two big X flares you see here were from region 3386, and they were happened when the Western Hemisphere was on the day side of Earth. As we take a look at the impact of the whisper net, you can definitely see HF radio communications were impacted during the big flare on the 7th. And we also had big radio bursts included that went clear up into the KA band. This means that we had radio bursts that it impacted GPS reception, satellite phone reception, and even up to Starlink frequencies. So we definitely had satellite radio communication interrupted for a little bit. And it, if you had issues during these days, it wasn't your technology, it just was the reception. So don't worry about it. Meanwhile, things have finally calmed down. We're back to hovering around the seafloor, but and with only C-class flares, but things are beginning to ramp up again. And that's mainly because we've got some new regions that are about to rotate into Earth view. So big flares might be back on the menu here in the next couple days. Switching to our radiation storm conditions, over this past week we've actually been dealing with two different radiation storms. The first occurred on the 5th and you can see it jumped up to S1 levels quite quickly and this can mean issues for uh, geolocation and, and navigation, as well as HF communication, especially over the poles with the aviators. But that's not the only thing. You can also see the blue line rise. That is a higher energy particles. And this means issues for, for satellite operators. In fact, as we take a look at the conditions and probabilities for impacts to satellites in the geo orbit, you can definitely see starting on the 5th, we had a high concern for single event effects. And this was occurring during the big geomagnetic storm as well, so that compounded the issues. Plus then you can see also concerns for total dose rising. And that's not the only thing. This was for the first radiation storm. As we pick up to the second radiation storm, you can see there's also high energy component as well. And again, now we're dealing with even a stronger total dose component. So satellite operators, especially in GEO, if you've been ex experiencing some issues, well, this is part of the reason why. So things luckily are beginning to calm down and it looks like the risk for radiation storms are also calming down. So it looks like we're going to be in the clear, at least for the next few days. 
Switching to our solar storm conditions, over this past week, we've had quite a bit of solar storm activity. We were expecting that train of solar storms to hit us, and indeed it did. Back on the 4th, we jumped up to active conditions when the first set of storms hit us, and then when the bigger storm hit, wham, it bumped us up to almost a G3 level and brought Aurora clear down deep into mid-latitudes. As we take a look at our Geochron clock, you can see when the storm really started ramping up. Sadly, Europe and, and the UK didn't get any of that big show that was basically the Western Hemisphere that was on the night side at that time, and you can watch the Aurora really ramp up. So we had gorgeous Aurora, Aurora views in Canada and cleared down deep into mid-latitudes in the United States. And then even as the storm began to wane, Believe it or not, uh, Australia and New Zealand and Tasmania, they still got a decent show. So we have some gorgeous Aurora highlights that I'll talk about more in a little bit. But that was the bulk of the show, and then things kind of calmed down since then. And we've only bumped up to active conditions one other time, and that was due to some other solar storms that grazed us to the west. They really didn't make much of a showing. And then we kind of quieted back down, and now we're just waiting for that fast solar wind to hit us from that coronal hole, and we could bump back up to active conditions again in about a couple days. And during this recent G3 level solar storm, Aurora was seen in many parts of the Western Hemisphere as well as down under. And I don't have the ability to share all of the gorgeous photos that Aurora field reporters were gracious enough to share with me, but I'll highlight a few of them here, like this gorgeous Aurora from Quebec. And we had gorgeous shots in Ontario. And of course, we had shots in Saskatchewan, as well as Alberta. And even British Columbia had some beautiful aurora. And as we drop down into the United States, aurora was seen in Maryland. And it was seen in several places in New York. It was seen clear down as far south as North Carolina. And it was seen in Illinois. It was even seen briefly in Pennsylvania. And we had Aurora in Iowa. And it was even seen in Kansas. It was seen in multiple places in Colorado. And it was seen in Idaho, as well as clear down in Utah and even in Flagstaff, Arizona. And as we go down under, Aurora was seen all over the place. It was seen in many places in New Zealand. Many beautiful shots in New Zealand. It was also seen in Tasmania. And we even had Aurora reach as far north as Victoria, Australia. Now, switching to our sun's far side, we can no longer use Stereo A imagery because Stereo A's orbit has now taken it to a place where it's basically looking at the sun from the front side, same as Earth. So in this case, we switch to our JSOC HMI Helioseismology far side viewer, and we use HMI AIA imagery of the sun from about two weeks ago to see what's lurking on the sun's far side. And as we take a look at the, uh, the helioseismology data, you can see everything in the gold is on the sun's far side, and we're looking for big dark spots. And as you watch, you can see old regions 3380, 86, and 87. Those are dark regions that are surviving their far side passage, and these are those big flare players. So we're keeping our eyes on them, but they won't be rotating into Earth view again for another 10 days or so. But outside of that, we also have regions, old regions 3379 and region 3382. And these regions also look like they might be surviving their far side passage, but they're not going to be rotating into Earth view for another maybe five days or so possibly a little bit more. So uh, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, hey, it looks like for the next few days, you're definitely going to have some quiet time. There's not going to be a big threat for big solar flares. So in this week, enjoy that respite, because next week, well, that's another story. 
Switching to our moon and meteors, we are now coming through the third quarter phase on our way to a new moon, with the new moon being on the 16th. And this is perfect considering the peak of the Perseid meteor shower is on the 12th and the 13th when the moon will be less than 10% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you haven't caught the dazzling show, now is your perfect chance. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are sitting at unsettled conditions right now, but we do have that coronal hole that's going to be rotating in through the Earth's strike zone and sending us some fast solar wind. Now, at high latitudes, NOAA is expecting active conditions, but we do have up to a 20 to 30 percent chance of minor storm conditions. So aurora photographers at high latitudes, you definitely could get a show, even if it's a weak one, especially with the dark skies because we're getting close to that new moon so you have some good luck in store now meanwhile at mid latitudes we're only expecting unsettled conditions but we do have up to a 15 to 25 percent chance of active conditions again this is starting around the 14th and could linger into the next couple days but aurora photographers if you're at mid latitudes it's going to be a little bit harder for you to catch a show but at least we have the perseids to keep you company Switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week. Thankfully, things have finally calmed down, especially compared to last week. The noise on the bands have dropped, the number of big active regions have dropped, and that is a blessing, obviously, but it also means that solar flux has dropped. We are all, we're sitting now at the low 150s and could even drop into the 140s before we begin to rise again perhaps around, right around the latter part of this week. But the good news means that we're actually at minor noise levels on the radio bands on Earth's day side, and that's easily going to continue over the next three days. NOAA, in fact, is only giving us about a 25% chance of M-class flares. That's at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and only about a 5% chance of X-class flares. And that's at the R3 level radio blackout. And this means that we basically have radio big radio blackouts off the table for now. Now, and that might change over the next maybe three or four days as some of these regions rotate to the sun's west limb and some new regions rotate into earth view but hey we'll take it it's a respite so enjoy if you happen to be doing dayside uh, amateur radio operating you're going to enjoy being able to hear contacts a lot better than you had last week and so enjoy because it's not going to last all that much longer Switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, we are dealing with the D2 minor range right now for you aviators. This is at flight level 360. This is due to the waning radiation storm that we have, and it's especially bad over the poles. But luckily, it's at the it's below the S1 level. We're just sitting at elevated levels right now, so things are definitely on their way back to normalcy. We only have about a day or two uh, to deal with this before things go back down to the D1 minor range. In fact, NOAA's only giving us about a 15% chance of jumping up to an S1 to S2 level radiation storm over the next day or so before things are, go completely back down to, to normal range. And this is good news for you uh, aviators as well as you frequent flyers and air crew. Just ride out the next day or so and everything will be back in the green. So the space weather this week has calmed down substantially compared to last week. Now we do still have a little chance of storming. This is due to that coronal hole that's rotating in through the Earth strike zone over the next couple days. Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you definitely could get a bit of a show. And if you're aurora photographers at mid latitudes, it might be a bit harder for you to get a show. But remember, we do have that new moon and we do have the Perseids that are peaking on the 12th and the 13th. So no matter what, our night sky should be absolutely gorgeous where there are clear skies. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, you should be smiling as well because those radio blackouts have really calmed down this week. You expect to get at least two or three days of quiet before things begin to ramp up a little bit. And that's due to some regions that are rotating to the sun's west limb and they could get active just like regions 33, 86 and 87. And oh, we just kind of drove us nuts last week. We could see a little bit of that kind of activity again. And then also later in the week, we're going to have some new regions rotating in from the sun's far side, and they could be big flare players too. So just enjoy the respite. And now GPS users, well, things are looking pretty good for you right now. We don't have any really big solar storms. We just have some issues maybe at high latitudes. And then also on Earth's day side, we have the radio blackouts calming down quite a bit. So pretty much all over the globe, your GPS reception should be top notch. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.